Hello friends, welcome to Coding Garden with CJ. Welcome to Newbie Tuesdays. In this episode, we are going to build a full stack app uh, from scratch with resident noob, Mr. Tony. Uh, say hello, Tony. What's going on? What's going on? Did, did you get a haircut? <laughs> uh, I guess you hadn't seen it yet. Um, yeah, I did it no. this weekend. Um, say hello, I guess. Cool. Hello, hello. Um, so, uh, if you're not familiar with this stream, this is where uh, I pair with Tony and we build an app from scratch. Tony has been coding for on and off for like a little over a year, maybe, and doesn't know much and asks lots of good questions. And yeah, anything else we should say, Tony? No, I, I think that covers it. Cool. Uh, so we have decided to build today a full stack application and we're going to be building a message board. Uh, and the idea is it's an anonymous message board, so there's no login or anything like that. Anyone can post a message. You just type whatever username you want in and your messages will have your username, the subject of the message, the actual text of the message, an image URL, and then we'll show when the message was actually created at. So we'll have a simple little page with a form where you can post a message. Those messages will get stored in the database, so when someone, uh, anyone comes back to the website, they'll see all of the previous messages. Um, our backend, we're going to be using Express. We will be using MongoDB for our database. Uh, we're going to use Vue.js on the front end. Um, I do plan to use a library called Monk for the database. Um, there's a really popular one for MongoDB called Mongoose, but that's a little more involved, and I wanted this to be very noob-friendly, so uh, we are going to use Monk. Uh, Shameless Scout asked in the chat, do I need to have any prior Node.js knowledge to follow this tutorial? I don't think so. Um, so Tony, I have wa I've walked Tony through building maybe two Node.js apps, and we are going to write it from scratch and like write it one line at a time. So if you've never used it before, this sh this should you should be able to follow along. Um, yeah, so we're going to build the back end routes to create the messages. We'll create the front end, which will have a form to create the message. We'll show the messages on the page. And then we have some stretch features that we might be able to get to, like replying to messages or grouping messages into categories. Like you could have like an anime section or a movies section or a nature picture section or something like that. But initially all the messages are just gonna be on one page. What say you, Tony? I say, cool. I say let's, let's do, do it. it. All right, so the first part is to create the server folder um, and we are using my computer. I have it shared with Tony remotely. Uh, so I am actually going to give control to Tony. You should be able to control my screen now. Uh, All <laughs> okay. right, big mistake. Uh, create a folder called server. Go into that folder. And then in here, we're going to do uh, npm init uh, space dash y. And so uh, if you are following along, you will need Node.js installed on your machine. Um, you can get that from the Node.js website, or if you're on a Mac, you can install it from Brew, or you can look up a thing called Node Version Manager and install it from there. But once you install Node, you get access to the Node command and the npm command. So this command we just ran created a package JSON, and I'll show that real quick. Essentially, this file keeps track of all of the packages that we install because we're gonna be using Express and Cores and Body Parser, and so all those will get listed in here. So when someone else uses this, uh, or tries to run this project, they'll be able to install those things. Cool, so we've got our package JSON. Uh, let's add these things. I'm just gonna copy them, because you type slow, Tony. Um, and then we'll do npm install, and then all of those things. So Express is what we're gonna use to create the backend API. Uh, Morgan is a tool that will log all of the incoming requests. Cores is a package that will let our client talk to our front end. And Body Parser is a package that will allow our back end to read and understand the data that we send from the front end. While that installs, uh, Tony, do you have any questions about any of those packages? Um, I don't think I've used uh, Morgan yeah, before. And I'll, so it's yeah, and I'll show exciting. how to set it up. It's super easy. But basically what it does is every single request that comes into the server, like a get request or a post request, it'll say like what time the request happened and what was the URL. So it's a lot easier to uh, debug things. 
Yeah. And there, cool. There's a question in the chat. Am I planning to make any React tutorials? I do plan to. Um, a couple of nights ago, I did build a to-do app with React. Um, it was pretty introductory. Um, I have talked about it in the past, but building that app made me realize how much I didn't like it. But I still might do it because I offer a unique point of view on learning how to code. So now that we did this npm install command, inside of the package JSON, all of these things are listed as dependencies. So that's a good thing. Um, and let's get going. So I'll create the file, and then Tony can get to typing. So in the server folder, we're going to create an index.js file. Now, Mr. Tony, the first thing I would like you to do is to bring in the express dependency. So say const express equals require, and then uh, put express in quotes inside of the require. So invoke require. Express. Yes. Um, and essentially what this is doing is this is bringing in the express dependency that we just installed. So that's great. So on the next line, uh, let's also bring in uh, cores, Morgan, and body parser, all in the very similar way. So const, uh, let's bring in cores, and then you say require cores. And then on the next line, do body parser, uh, do it camel case. Hey, Joe, welcome to the chat. Uh, and Scott, welcome to the chat. And then also Morgan, yeah. And so um, for all the, the Node.js newbies out here, like this is, this is kind of how it works. So we ran that command on the terminal that installed all of these packages. And this is how we actually use these things inside of our Node.js application. OK, so um, right there, let's create an app variable. So say const app. And we're just going to set that equal to express invoke. So this is how you create an express app. You require an express and then invoke express. Cool. So we have a basic express app. Um, now we're going to use all these other packages. And these other packages are known as middleware. Essentially, they add new functionality to our express app. So uh, on the next line, and actually leave an empty space. Um, and the first one we'll uh, add is Morgan. So this is the logging um, package that I talked about. So do, well, uh, you don't have to create a variable. Say, app.use and then pass in uh, Morgan and invoke it and then pass it the string tiny. Yes, just like that. <laughs> so um, we could look at the uh, documentation for Morgan, but essentially this is how you add the logger to your app and tiny is just the kind of log that it's going to add. They have different kinds of um, or different ways to log things. Um, tiny will is just like a basic date, URL, and any, any, whatever the request is. This is my break timer. Let's take a quick break. I am drinking enlightened yerba mate tea, and it has lots of green on it, so it's actually blending in with my green screen. Cool. Are you drinking anything today, Tony? I got some iced coffee, so uh, yeah. Did you make it yourself? No, this is from oh, the Starbucks. Starbucks. Cool. Down the street. <laughs> the Starbucks. Um, okay, so that that adds Morgan as uh, a middleware. Let's also add cores. So you do it in a similar way. Just say app.use and then pass in cores and then invoke it. And we don't have to pass any parameters into that. Yeah, nothing there. Cool. And then the last thing we need is body parser. But for that, um, actually go ahead and, and do it. Say app.use body parser invoke it but then we're going to go to the body parser docs to see how we add um, the uh, JSON body parser because basically uh, we're going to be sending data to our server from the client and this package actually parses the data that we send from the client but let's let's look it up so all of these packages we installed um, you can find on npm if you just search for them by name and body parser is the one that we installed and um, we can see that it does JSON. There's usually an example. Oh, actually, that's all we need. <laughs> so instead of invoking body parser, you do body parser dot JSON and invoke JSON. So let's update that. Yes. So that now our server can accept JSON being sent from the client. Um, and yeah, that's all of our middleware set up. Now let's just create a basic uh, git route so that we can make sure our server's working. So do app.git. 
And then the first parameter will be the string slash in uh, single quotes and do a forward slash. <laughs> um, so inside the single quotes, do a forward slash. Yeah, cool. So basically what this says is when a git request comes into our server with the URL slash, this is going to run. So after the quotes, do a comma, and then we're gonna create our request handler. And uh, we'll do a fat arrow function. So do parentheses and the parameters. Uh, so the before the fat arrow, do parentheses with uh, rec, parentheses, not quotes. Cool. Uh, first parameter is rec, this is the request, comma, res, and this is the response. And then after that, do after the parentheses, do the, the fat arrow. And then uh, use curly braces and do a new line. Cool. And so the idea is when a get request comes into our app on the URL slash, this function is going to run. And we're just going to send back a JSON response. So right here, do res.json. So it says send a JSON response, invoke it, and then just pass in an object literal. Do a new line and uh, give this object a property called uh, message. And the value will be um, full stack message board. Exclamation mark, and I will add an emoji. Uh, party? Yeah, that one. Cool. Um, <laughs> uh, question in the chat. Uh, body parser parses into JSON. Yeah, so um, in a bit, when we actually create the front end that has a form to create a message, that's where this will actually come into play because our form is going to be making a post request to the server. A post request has uh, data in it that the server needs to receive. And this middleware essentially is in charge of looking at the data that gets sent to the server and turning it into a JSON object so that we can actually like insert it into the database. Cool. So we've got a basic Git route. Last thing we need to do is start our server on a specific port. Um, so first, let's create a variable. So say const port equals, we'll say uh, process.env. All capital port. Oh, you, you have that right. So just do dot and then port in all capital letters. Yeah. Space or, or like the, so the double pipe. Space. Let's do, um, what's your favorite four digit number, Tony? Oh, um, let's just okay. do one, two, three, four. So do one, two, three, four. And then do a semicolon. And then on the next line, we're going to listen on this port. So do app.listen, and then invoke it. The first parameter will just be that port variable that we created. And the second parameter is going to be a function that gets called to do, uh, just do a fat arrow with no parameters. You do need the empty uh, parentheses before the fat arrow. Parentheses, Tony. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm like, oh, my brain's a little from fried work. from uh, okay. no from work. Um, so, uh, yeah, and then do create a, a a body, and then on the next line, just do a console log, and uh, we'll do a template string. Do you know where the back tick is on your keyboard? There it is. Uh, and say uh, listening on, and then. Uh, use uh, dollar sign curly braces inside of there to, to show the, the port variable inside of that string. Yeah. Yes, sir, you got it. All right. I'm going to help you out here, add some semicolons. And now we have a basic Express app. So we brought in all our dependencies. We've we're using all of our middleware. We have a basic git route on slash that should respond with a simple message. And when we start up the app, it's going to be listening uh, by default on port 1234. But the reason we did this is if we ever deploy to like Heroku or some, some other deployment service, a lot of times they choose what port our server will be listening on. 
So we don't want to hard code it because um, if they choose a port for us, it'll be set on this variable and then our app will listen there. Okay, so now we want to start this thing up. Let's create a start script. So in the package JSON, um, let's overwrite this test script to be start. And then the start command is just going to be node index.js. So um, that's all it takes to start up this express server that we defined inside of this file. So now that we have this start script, we should be able to start it up. If I do npm start listening on 1234, and I'm going to bring up Postman. Uh, this is a free tool. You can find it if you just Google uh, or search the web for Postman. Uh, this is a tool that allows us to um, make requests to our server to see if it's actually working. So don't save that. I'm going to make a git request to http colon slash slash localhost port 1234 slash. And we get back our message. Zoom in a bit. It's working, Tony. So, and this will keep getting information as long as we're still serving information exactly. on so, that port. Uh, because, and, and this is where Morgan came into play. So you'll notice it said um, a get request came in on slash. We responded with the 200 status code um, and it took three milliseconds to respond. So like uh, every time we make a new request, you'll see it logged there, see that? And so this is happening because we added that Morgan package, which is pretty convenient because later on when we start making other requests, we'll be able to see those coming in as well. Um, so we'll be able to see like when messages get posted exactly. to the board. And like. so, and one thing you just mentioned, like if I kill this server, so to kill the server in the terminal, you do control C. If I kill it and I try to make this request, then Postman will just fail. It's like, there's nothing listening on that port. I can't make a request there. Cool. Um, one other thing is um, every time we cha make changes to this index.js, we would have to restart the server. So um, in order to not have to do that, we're going to install a package called uh, nodemon. Um, so I'll just do that real quick. npm install nodemon. And I'm going to save this as a dev dependency. So dash dash save dash dev. Um, the difference between a regular dependency and a, de a development dependency is when I deploy this, so if I actually put this on a server like Heroku, anything that's a dev dependency, it won't install because it doesn't need it. And so Nodemon is something that we only need locally because when this thing is running in the cloud and deployed, we don't want it restarting all the time. We only want this to happen uh, locally when we're, when we're working on it. If you commit this to GitHub, would it still save the dev dependency? Right, and yeah, and I'll show you where that where that gets added. So, um, so you notice our dependencies are here, and then there's this other section, dev dev dependencies. Oh. Yeah. And so whenever um, Heroku, whenever they 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 essentially will do an npm install when you deploy, but they only install these. They don't install the the dev dependencies. Cool. And next thing is we'll we'll just add another script that uses Nodemon instead. So we'll call it dev. And we'll say nodemon index.js. Um, and essentially works the same way, but anytime nodemon detects changes to the index.js, it'll automatically restart the server. And so now if we want to run it, um, let's do this, no clear. We can do uh, npm run dev. That should start up nodemon. And then now we can make requests. Cool. And if we ever. Uh, make any changes to the file, it'll automatically restart and we won't have to restart the server. So one of the things that I, I've seen is like, you showed me light server a long time ago and there's like things like light server and like npm run serve. So like, I don't really understand the difference between all these different cool. commands. So light server is typically used for like when you're developing a front end. And so I would, I would say light server is synonymous with Nodemon for the back end. But light server is really only used when you're building static front end apps, and Nodemon is only used when you're when you're when you're building back end node apps. Um, when I say npm run dev, that is just talking about scripts defined in my package.json. So um, technically, if you had a front end app and you installed light server as a dependency, you could actually have a start script that says light server. And then if you ran npm start, it would look at this and then run light server instead. So uh, npm scripts are just a way of 
um, putting commands behind easy to remember commands. Like I know that npm start will run node. I know that npm run dev will run node mon. And that's just so I don't have to type node mon every time. Um, does that help? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So it's like, Nodemon, Light Server, these are these are tools, and then npm scripts are ways of like running those tools, but giving them like a an easy to remember name. Cool. Let's look at our checklist. So we inited it, we added all those packages, we created a hello world route. Let's work on the client folder. Cool. So we are going to use uh, Vue.js. Um, let's do it. So I'll open a new tab. Let's go up one directory. Let's run the view create command. So um, do in the PX space at view slash CLI. So in PX is a way of running a command. Um, and it's a view slash CLI. Um, it's a way of running a global command without installing it globally. So this is actually going to download the view CLI command and run it all in one go. If you have node and npm installed, this command should work for you. Um, and then do space create. And let's just uh, do another space and let's call it uh, client. So this will create a client folder and then ask us some questions about the view app that we're about to create. Yeah, so hit enter. Let me make this a little bit bigger. How did you get the little Buddha um, to appear in your node oh, as well? Uh, you talking about uh, this? Yeah. Uh, that, that's, yeah. that's not Buddha. That's <laughs> yeah. uh, Tux, the Linux penguin. Um, but I have a uh, a special Bash profile that um, will show a random quote and then like the Linux penguin uh, on there. I can show that later. Uh, remind remind me to explain that again later. Cool. Um, so if you press the down arrow, go all the way down to uh, manually select features and then press enter. And so uh, if you run this tool locally on your machine, you won't see all that stuff. Those are just uh, presets that I saved locally. You can just go to uh, manually select features. So um, do a space bar on router and then do spacebar on linter and formatter. Um, I'm thinking we, uh, yeah, I don't wanna use Vuex. I think it introduces too much complexity for now. So yeah, this is, this is all we need. Uh, just hit enter and then uh, we'll take a quick break. I told you that story about the, uh people at work that saw the tux penguin no, right there were some people that uh we had like a piece of equipment that apparently ran mm -hmm. on linux and uh i told i was telling somebody to shut this thing down and um uh, when they booted it back up they like they're like i was like what, what does it say on the screen they're like i don't know there's just a sad <laughs> penguin sad that's great um okay go to press arrow down to eslint airbnb config Hit enter, uh, press spacebar for lint on save, and then arrow down and press spacebar for lint and fix on commit, and then hit enter. And it should generate our view. So uh, arrow down to in package JSON, hit enter, click uh, in. We don't want to save this for, for the future. Hit enter. This will generate our app, and it will create a client folder. Um, while that's going, let's check out Bootswatch. So if you're not familiar, Bootstrap is a um, CSS framework that comes with lots of pre-configured components like alerts and cool looking cards and good looking buttons and cool looking lists. And essentially all you do is add the CSS to your page and then you get access to all these different classes. We're gonna use a thing called Bootswatch, which is essentially, it's still bootstrap, but uh, they've gone through the trouble of creating like custom themes so that it looks a little bit different. You use it in exactly the same way, but it'll look a little bit different. So Tony, which which theme should we use? Cyborg. Cyborg? Cyborg. Yeah, so cool. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, and so you use Bootstrap, but it has like a black background and like these these cooler cooler colors. Okay, cool. So to add this, you just click here, and then you can go to the minified CSS. I'll copy that in. Let's see. So it is done generating. We can go into the client folder. Um, if we run npm run serve, we should just get a basic uh, Vue.js application running on port 8080. Yeah, so basic view app. But let's add this CSS and we can see like what it changes. So go into the client folder. In the public folder is our main index.html. And just right here, we can add a link tag with that CSS file and then save it. And then we automatically get some dark styles in our Vue.js app. Cool. Cool, cool. Um, let's check our README. We created it. We added Bootswatch. Let's do a quick tour of our front end app and like everything that got generated. And then we'll work on the basic layout. So when you generate a Vue.js app, um, your package JSON will have some pre-configured scripts in there. So when I did npm run serve, it's actually running this command here, which opens up the Vue.js application. Um, there's a command for building it. So if we deploy it, um, that will create the files to deploy it. And actually, I, I want to deploy this today, Tony. We haven't really deployed any of the apps we've worked on in the past. So let's, let's not forget to deploy, because then all of the wonderful people out there on the internet can actually use this application. Sound good? Cool. Sounds great. And so in the source directory is all of your uh, files for your view app. We can pretty much ignore everything um, except for we'll, we'll, we'll be working on like one component and then maybe later on we'll, we'll make other components. But main.js is how everything gets configured. It brings in the view library. It brings in this component that got created and it brings in the router. Right now, we're just going to have one basic route, but I thought it'd be nice to have the router because later on, if we add uh, different topics for message boards, each message board topic could have a different route, that kind of thing. Um, this creates an instance of view and then mounts it on ID app. So if we look again at that index.html, um, that has a div right there. And essentially, that's where our entire Vue.js application is going to live is on that one div. Um, if we look at app.view, it has some router links here. We'll go ahead and get rid of those, and we'll get rid of these default styles. <clears throat> and if we look at router.js, we can see there are two routes right now. There's the home route on the slash URL and the about route on the, sla on the slash about. I'm going to get rid of the about route and I'm going to get rid of the about component. So if we look in views, there is this about component. I'm just going to delete it. So by default, we only have, um, oh, did I delete the entire folder? Oh, no. Didn't mean to do that. Uh, can I put it back? Put it back. Add folder. Oh no. I'm messing up, Tony. Um I did not mean to do that. Oh well, here's what we'll do. We'll just copy this component and we'll recreate it. Okay, so let's uh, remove folder from workspace. In the source directory, <laughs> we need a new folder called uh, views. This needs a file called home.view. And we'll add that in. OK, crisis averted. Imagine if it was a GIF. <laughs> OK, so um, we have our app.view. This is just a basic Vue.js component. And where it says router view right here, this is where our routes get loaded in. So because our router says, um, this should work now. I need to close it. Yeah, because we re-added that file. But basically, this file brings in that home view that got created and says, when the URL is slash, load that component there. Um, and so we have this in here. Right now, this is bringing in a separate component called hello world, and this is where all of that that content is. I'm even going to get rid of that. So in here, we are just going to have 
like a basic h1 that says full stack message board get rid of bringing in the component and um, just save that okay so now by default on the slash URL we should just see this h1 let's even get rid of this class full stack message board okay are you tracking Tony <laughs> I'm tracking uh, like only my minor, minor okay, yeah, nose bleeds you have so basically we've just really um, reduced the app to only one route right now and that's yeah, and the so home. when we say URL slash we're actually talking about this so anything that's after the uh, the hash that's the URL so because the URL now is slash the router says load the home view and the home view right now just has an h1 inside of it so that's that's all we're seeing okay all right cool. that makes sense and so one thing we want to do is just like some basic layout so let's add a nav bar if we go back to the bootstrap docs um, which one of these nav bars do you want to add let's uh let's keep going with the dark theme let's do so that second one black there. on black okay um, but here's what I'm gonna do so because the way the router works is um, whatever the route is that's what's gonna get loaded we're actually gonna put the nav bar on top of where the route gets loaded so the nav bar is always shown like no matter what page you're on so like in app.view router view is where that route gets loaded in but if we put this nav bar right above it then later on if we um, well do that later on if we add more pages the nav bar will always be at the top and so just like that if we save that we have that basic nav bar up top cool and you'll notice this is getting loaded because that's where the the router view is um, let's get rid of all that extra stuff we really just want to show like a um, um, Like a title right here, full stack message board. Yeah, I was gonna say like, yeah, gonna say, like if anything, like all the uh, the only route that should exist right now would be like to link back to the uh, just normal hash. Yeah, so we can actually do. Yeah, we can actually like do home. that there. So if we click this, it just redirects us back to the home page. Cool. <laughs> um, and actually now, let me also get rid of this. Even I'm even gonna get rid of this hello world component. This is a component that got generated when we generated the app. Goodbye. All right, so now we have a super super basic app. This is the home. So we should see that. Cool. Uh, let's look at our checklist. So we've got our basic layout. It's like nav bar, and then our message board is going to go below it. Um, we're going to work on, on that in a little bit, but um, we'll probably just have like a basic form at the top where you can put in your message and image, click add, and then it gets added below it. Nothing more complex than that. But now, back to the back end, we're going to add some database logic to the back end code. Are you ready, Tony? I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. Let's okay, cool. do it. So um, let's close all these files, minimize our client, and let's look at server. So uh, we are going to use a package called Monk. Let me look it up on NPM. Um, this is a library for talking to a Mongo database. Um, it's really simple. It um, it's really easy to connect to a Mongo database, and then we can uh, just start reading the database and inserting things into it fairly simply. Um, I already have MongoDB installed on my machine. Um, I believe so. Brew install Mongo. If you're on a Mac, you can use Brew, and um, Let's see, do they list it here? Yeah, so if you're on a Mac, you can just do brew install MongoDB. If you're on Windows, you can download the community edition from their website and just install it. Uh, once you install it, it should be up and running. And um, you should, in your terminal, I think the command is Mongo. Yeah, so if you have once you have it installed, if you type Mongo, this drops you down into a Mongo shell where you can actually start executing database commands and like reading your database. Um, 
actually know how to get out of here slash Q exit. Okay, cool. Um, but if you can run that command and it drops you into a shell, you know that Mongo database is running on your machine. Uh, but essentially, MongoDB is a NoSQL database. There are lots of different types of databases. Um, if you've heard of MySQL or Postgres, those are known as SQL databases. And SQL databases are typically uh, used for relations. You can have different uh, tables where data is stored. Think of a table like a, sh uh, 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 a sheet in an Excel spreadsheet. It's got like rows and columns. Um, but a SQL database would allow you to have relationships between tables. Mongo database is essentially a place where you can put JSON objects with really any structure and you just throw them into the database and then later on if you want them back you can pull them out. Um, but it's very unstructured and that's pretty much why we're going to be using it. Um, we'll have a super basic document store where we're storing all of our messages. All of our messages for the message board is, are essentially just going to be a JSON object that have a few properties like username, message, image URL. Um, and then we can make a request that gets all of those messages out of the database and essentially we get back an array of JSON objects. I realize that was really fast and hand wavy and I talked a lot about, about a lot of stuff, but what questions do you have, Tony? So, um, I guess like first and foremost, does the database exist on your machine? So the database like... exists on some server somewhere. So right now when we're, we're developing it locally, it exists on my machine. Um, and anything we create or add to the database will only exist here on my laptop. When we deploy, we're actually going to have to find a service that allows us to host a Mongo database. And then that will be totally separate from our database here on my machine. But we're going to write code that tells our express server how to connect to the Mongo database. And so when we deploy, we'll have a special URL so the express server knows how to connect to like a remote server that has that Mongo database on it. <laughs> Questions, thoughts, what, what do you think? I th I, okay, th I think that makes sense. Um, so basically, um, we'll, we'll have to like talk to the Mongo database and... Yeah, and in a second, when I show you how we connect to it, I'll show you like, where the, the connection to some Mongo database hosted on some server in the cloud is going to go later on. Because when, if when we do deploy, we're going to have to create a Mongo database in the cloud, and that's where all our data is going to be stored, and then we'll tell Express how to connect to that. OK, and um, just, I'm assuming that since like we're not going to be like paying for hosting for this because it's gonna be like a small app like yeah. i'm assuming like there's like a limit yeah, so I'll, to i'll show how much with, the... with heroku you can actually set up a free mongo database and they allow like a few thousand rows for free no need to add a credit card or anything like that you can just host it for free while it's in development let's take a quick break and then we'll we'll get connected to the database okay so um, in the server folder, we are going to install monk. So do uh, npm install monk. Uh, Martin Clifford says Heroku heart. Heroku is great. <laughs> um, yeah, then hit enter. And so this is going to install this monk package, which allows us to talk to the database. And you can see in their example here, like, localhost slash mydb, uh, this is how it's connecting to the database. So when we're locally on our machine, we'll just have like a simple connection string, but then whenever we deploy, we're gonna change this to be whatever the URL is of that database on Heroku. Cool, so that installed Monk. Um, now let's let's get it going. So let's see what I have in my, in my readme. Um, I do wanna use Joy also. So Monk is, a super simple library, like you can essentially uh, insert anything you want into the database. Um, and, and this is one of the, the aspects of MongoDB is it does not have a strict schema, meaning 
you can really insert in anything you want. If you're using a package like Mongoose, which is uh, a library you can use with Node and Express to insert into a database, this lets you create schemas and it will do things like validation. Like if the object you're inserting is missing a property, it will throw an error and it won't let you insert it. But MongoDB, the database itself, it doesn't care. It'll let you insert in anything. So we're gonna do some basic validation with a library called Joy. And basically we'll just create a really basic schema that says like a message should have a username, it should have a message, it can have an image URL, and it should have a created at date. Basically we'll, we'll create a simple validation so that we don't allow the user to insert like random things into our database. Question? Would you, would you use this kind of thing as well to make sure like somebody is not able to like spam messages? Uh, you could. Um, this would basically make sure that the object has all of the right properties, but you can also do some validation and say like the username can only be 30 characters long. Um, if you wanted to do some, I don't know, like, policing and say like the message cannot contain curse words or something like that you'd have to write like separate separate logic for that um, and if you wanted to say like don't let a user insert in a hundred messages every second you would have to have use a separate library for that um, it's it, those are all possible things though okay uh, as far as like if you do any sort of like sensor thing do they I know um like a lot of times filters are weird. Is that because they just use like a different library to do that sort of thing? And like the, the filter just kind of does its yeah, best. Yeah, definitely. And so like <clears throat> we're talking about websites that like try to prevent users from saying curse words or like uploading different things. And yeah, it's really just a library that <clears throat> it's trying its best to prevent the user from doing that, but it happens anyways. Okay, let's install Joy. And then we'll get to creating something that'll let us insert into the database. So do uh, npm install joy, J-O-I. And Emmy, you're welcome. Um, see you later. Thanks for tuning in. Cool, so now we have joy. And let's create a message model. So on our server, I'm gonna create a new folder. We're gonna call this um, db. And inside of there, uh, we're going to create a new file, and we'll call this uh, connection.js. And so in this file, we're going to actually define our connection to the Mongo database. And so if we look at the monk documentation, we can see that it's actually really simple to create a connection. We just do this. And we'll actually do this on a separate line. So first, Tony, uh, create a variable called monk and um, set it equal to requiring in the monk library. Cool. And then right after that, create a variable, let's call this a uh, connection string. And right now we're just gonna set this equal to um, single quotes, say localhost slash message board. Uh, all one word, localhost. <clears throat> cool. And Essentially, this is the connection to our database. So because we're running this locally right now, localhost points to the MongoDB running on my machine, and then message board is gonna be the name of the database that we're connecting to. Uh, we could give this absolutely any name. The interesting thing about MongoDB is if you connect to a database and it doesn't exist, it automatically creates it for you. So later on when we connect, it'll automatically create it. So that's good. And then on the next line, create a variable called db. And we're going to set that equal to monk invoked with connection string. Cool. And so essentially, this now connects to the database, and then db holds the connection to the database. So let's export db from this file so that we can use this connection in another file. So um, on this line, say module.exports equals db. And so now we're going to create another file, and we'll just call this um, message model.js. 
<clears throat> and the idea of a model is we're essentially um, we're going to write methods for inserting into the database and then also reading from the database, but all of that will be stored in here. And so that way, inside of our express routes, we're not like directly connecting to the database. We'll be using this, this message model. So first thing is, let's import in or require in that connection that we just created. So say uh, const db equals require. And then in quotes, you're going to create a uh, relative path to connection. So you do dot slash connection. And basically what we're saying is we're requiring in the thing that we exported here. So this is in connection.js. We're exporting the connection to the database. And then in here, we're requiring that in. Cool. So if we look back at the monk docs, um, you'll notice to get access to a specific collection, you just say db.get. So our collection, we're just going to call it messages. Um, and essentially, you can think of messages as like an array of all the possible messages that could ever get created. And we'll be able to read from that array and insert into that array. Um, and there's a quick question in the chat. Is that monk have the same functionality as ConnectJS like I used in the CRUD API? So ConnectJS specifically is for talking to SQL databases like Microsoft SQL Server or MySQL or Postgres. Monk is specifically for talking to MongoDB. Um, it's similar in that it lets you interface with the database, uh, but they're different because one is for SQL databases and one is for MongoDB. Okay. So on this line, let's create a variable called messages. So say const messages equals db.get messages. Uh, so invoke it and put uh, messages in a string. Yes, and we'll call this messages. Cool. Um, and let's let's create one one function so uh, create a function let's call it get all messages or we'll just call it get all and inside of that we'll just return messages.find uh, and invoke find Cool. And so if we look at the monk docs, there are, there are different ways to talk to the database. Um, find, if you pass in no parameters, it essentially says, give me all of the things in the messages collection. And so when we do a find with no parameters, this should give us back all of the messages in the messages array, uh, in the messages collection. Cool. Um, Right now, do a module.exports. We're going to export an object that has get all on it. I do a module.exports equals an object. And then on that object, put, uh, so do a new line and just say get all. And so essentially, we're going to make this get all function available in another file. Um, and let's just create a basic express route now. So now that we have, and let's let's rename this messages model. Let's just call this messages. And in our index.js, we're going to require in that messages file. So just say const messages equals uh, require. And again, we're going to use a relative file path. So do uh, in quotes dot slash db slash messages. And you do need the dot at the beginning because that we then it knows it's a relative file path. So this says go into the db folder and grab the messages file, which is where we're exporting that object. Cool. And then let's just make a basic express route that uses that. So um, right there, let's do an app.get, but this time the URL is going to be slash messages. Cool, and then give it a request handler. Uh, am I doing, yeah, am I so doing this right? Exactly like this one. So first, don't forget the comma, okay. and then yeah, keep on going. 
<clears throat> cool. And so now we actually want to call that get all messages uh, function that we defined. So we can say messages dot get all. And then invoke it and say dot then uh, outside the parentheses. And then we'll invoke this, give it a fat arrow where the parameter is messages in inside the parentheses. And before the fat arrow, you want to say messages because that's the thing that we're going to be getting back. And then uh, give it a function body. And then inside of the function body, we'll do a res.json and then pass in messages. OK. Yeah, so we'll fix that. Put that in parentheses. Get rid of the extra space there. Get rid of the extra space there. Cool. All right, so what this says is when a get request comes into the server on slash messages, we're going to go to this get all uh, uh, function, which actually talks to the database to get all of the messages that are in the database. And then when we get them back, we should get back an array of messages. And then we're just going to respond with a JSON array of those messages that are in the database. Now, right now, there's nothing in the database. So we should just get back an empty array. What questions do you have about what we have done so far, Tony? Um, I don't think I have any questions okay, right that. now. And uh, Martin has a question in the chat. Uh, are we watching him type as CJ instructs? Yes. <laughs> and um, I, I'm just sharing my screen with him, so it's a little delayed sometimes. Which sometimes it takes him a little bit longer to type. Let's take a quick stretch. <clears throat> Every now and then, I'll I'll chime in and like type just because I'm I'm a little impatient. I don't know. Okay, let's try it. So now in Postman, we should be able to say, I get request on slash messages. And we get back an empty array. It's a beautiful <laughs> little block. Right? And so right now, there's nothing in the database. So we're just getting back nothing. Cool. Let's look at our readme. I think we got a little ahead of ourselves because um, I just wanted to show that working. So like we have our message model. Um, now that we're just returning all of the uh, messages in the database, let's actually create a function that will insert a message into the database. So um, let's create another function, and let's call this uh, insert. And then it will accept one parameter called message. I'm sorry, you cut uh, out. The what parameter was that? for this function will be message. So basically, we're going to pass a message object into this function. And then we will say, um, after that, say return messages.create I think that's the function we'll, we'll double check uh, no no dot on there and so just like we did um, messages.find we want to do messages.create and then pass in the thing that we're going to be creating and so uh, in create pass in message Cool. And let's just look at the monk docs, because this actually might be insert instead of create. Let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, it is insert. So I got that wrong. So we should say uh, messages.insert instead of create. So we're doing messages.create. Nope. Uh, so notice how this is dot insert. So this needs to be insert instead of create. Yes, and it should be as simple as that. This will actually take whatever we're passing into it and put it into the database. Um, and let's let's re let's rename this to create, and then we'll uh, add create to the exports down there. Cool. And so we have these two functions. One of them creates a message and inserts it into the other uh, into the database. The other one um, will get all of the messages that are in the database. Now, before we allow this to happen, this is where joy comes into play because I want to do some basic validation to make sure that the message has all of these properties. Because we don't want them just inserting anything into the database. Whoa. Cool. 
cool. So let's look at that joy library that we installed. And let's do this. OK, so put that over there, put that over there, close that. Uh, up at the top of the file, let's require in joy, just like you see in the example there. Uh, do a capital joy. And this is actually a reference to happy, happy, joy, joy from Rin and Snippy. Cool. <laughs> and then um, let's define the schema right here. So say uh, const schema equals joy dot object. And then invoke it. And then we'll say dot keys. And then invoke that. And then pass in an object. Do a new line, cool. And so basically, uh, we're gonna somewhat mimic what they have in their example, but we wanna have um, these keys in R in ours, and we'll decide like what should their validations be. Um, so we do want a username key. And we'll say joy.string and do uh, dot alpha num. And um, Like if, yeah, we can see in their example, they're saying that the, the username must be a minimum of three characters and a maximum of 30, um, and it is required. Let's just say that ours is alphanumeric and required. Like we don't care how long it is. It could be like one character, but we just want to say it's required. So do dot required. Cool. And then do a comma. And then on the next line, um, we need a subject. And um, let's do the, the like the a very similar validation, but it doesn't have to be alphanumeric because the subject can have like exclamation points and stuff like in that. So it's a string, and it's required. Yeah. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. Cool. Uh, invoked, and then we also want the message and let's do string and let's say that it has a max of 500 and it is required yeah so they can't create a message that's more than 500 characters long um, Let's say image URL, and I believe they actually have a URL type. So you can probably do joy.url, and this will actually validate to make sure that it has like HTTP colon slash slash do dot URL invoked. Yeah, and let's let's look at their docs because they probably have something for URL. Uh, let's go to the detailed API reference. Um, string dot URI, I think I saw. Let's look at it. Requires the string to be a valid URI. Um, scheme specifies one or more acceptable schemes. Let's see if there's uh, like an image validator. PNG, JPEG, no. So this is probably what we want. We want like URI and um, the scheme should just be HTTPS, I think, or uh, HTTP or HTTPS. So let's, let's do this and I'll just copy it for you. Um, so the image URL should be a URI. We don't want it to be Git. We just want it to be um, HTTP or HTTPS. So if they try to give us a URL that doesn't have HTTP or HTTPS on it, this should fail. And we're not going to require an image for every um, message. We could do, uh, I think you can also do a regex. 
Because we could say, well, yeah, let's just say, yeah, we, we, we don't have to validate if it's an image, but we can say that the image is optional, meaning like you can post a message that doesn't have an image on it. And I think um, op presence can be optional. Let's let's see. So this is saying password is optional. And yeah, so I think basically it, because um, that you don't put required on there, then it doesn't have to be present when we're validating an object. Cool. Yeah, I saw one of the things that it defaults to option. Awesome. So I think I think that's um, that's all we need, and we'll we will put created at on there ourselves whenever we create it. But let's attempt to validate it. So basically, before we insert it is where we want to do the validation. So here we can say uh, const result equals uh, joy dot validate. I do a capital joy. And then the first parameter is going to be message because essentially we're going to be validating the message that they sent to us. And then the second parameter I think is schema. Cool. Let's double check over here. So yeah, so the first thing is what we're validating. The second thing is the schema. Um, and then we'll say after that, we'll say if result.error is equal to null. Uh, then give that if a body. So, um, well, after the, let me do it. <laughs> so uh, if result.error was null, then we will insert into the database. But before we insert, we do want to say message.created is a new date. So like right when we insert it into the database, we're going to set the current date. Um, and then <clears throat> if there was an error, we actually want to send that back so we can see it on the front end. So do an else statement there. Uh, curly braces. And then do uh, return promise dot reject and I do a capital promise dot reject and then pass in result dot error cool should be enough so basically what we're doing is um, yeah I just, we just call this created uh, we will validate to make sure <clears throat> that um, all of these properties are on there. And then if they are, we'll add the created and then insert it into the database. And then if they're not, we'll re re return with an error. Cool. Questions, comments, thoughts about this, Tony? Um, I guess uh, my question would be, we're going to call this function with um, like a button click well, probably, we're actually right? Going, we're going to be calling an express route with a button click, something like that, yeah. Um, but basically, we need to create the route first, and that route will take in the request body, try to insert it into the database. Um, but yes, you're, you're, you're thinking in the right terms. Like basically, this function eventually will get called whenever we like submit a form somewhere. But there's a few steps in, in the middle. Right, so we basically are creating the parameters that our form is going to take and then seeing if that those parameters are even valid based on whatever yeah, we decide the main if those thing parameters is, like, are. I'll show real quick. So let's, let's go ahead and create the route that's going to accept whatever the user typed into the form. So right after this, we're going to do a post. So after this, do a app.post. And the URL will be the same. Just make it uh, in quotes slash messages. And then um, do a comma, create your request handler. Yep. And then right here, let's just do a console.log of rec.bot. 
body. So rec.body is going to be whatever was sent to the server. Uh, and don't invoke it. It's just a, a parameter. And essentially, um, whatever was sent to the server, we're going to see it in our terminal, in our uh, server side logs. And whatever was sent into the server, this is actually what we we want to insert into the database. So right after this console log, do a uh, messages dot create, and then pass in rec dot body. Because whatever was sent to the server, this is what we're going to try to insert into the database. And then do a similar thing to what we did before. So do a dot then. And uh, that function will just accept message, singular, not plural. Singular, yep. And then give it a body. And then we'll just do a res.json with the message. Wait, so what are we doing with that? We're just doing request. Yeah, so uh, and then, um, yeah, it'll be exactly the same as this, but instead of messages, we're going to do res.json with message. Cool. And uh, this dot then will only get run if it was successful. But you'll notice in the function that we wrote, um, we'll say if there were errors, we're doing a promise.reject. When you do a promise.reject, you can access that with a dot catch. So right here, do a dot catch. Uh, let me close my break timer just real quick. Okay, yeah, so do a dot catch, invoke it, and then uh, this will accept a fatero function where the parameter is error. Nope. So uh, error is the parameter to the fat arrow function. And then what we're going to do right here is we'll say uh, res.status. So basically, we're going to tell the, the thing making the request that this was an invalid request, invoke that, and pass in 500. So we're going to say this was an invalid request. And then right after that, do res.json and pass in the error. Cool. So now we have this route defined on our backend. It says when we see, receive a post request on slash messages, uh, we're going to take the body of the request and attempt to insert it into the database. If there were any errors when we tried to insert it, respond with an error. So now we can actually uh, test this with Postman. Uh, Postman. So let me just kill this so I can do this. And now, if we try to do a post request to slash messages. So inside of Postman, you, on the body tab, you can specify like a JSON body. So if you click on raw and then choose a JSON, you actually get to specify the data that you're sending to the server. So right now, I'm just going to send, uh, let's say, username is CJ. But if I try to send this to the server, this is invalid data because it's missing the message, it's missing the subject, it's missing a lot of things. So when I make a post to this URL with this body, first we should see it logged out, but then we should get back an error because it doesn't have all of the, the properties that we said it should have. Is this making sense, Tony? Yes. Okay, click send, what yes. happens? Okay, so first we see that the body was logged. And so this log right here is coming from console.log rec.body. So essentially, when you send data to a server, that is the body of the request. And so let's just compare this real quick. So we're making a post request to slash messages. So that is going to hit this request handler. And the body of our request is this object. So when we log it here, we're actually seeing what we sent to the server. And so we can see that what we're logging here is pretty much exactly what we sent. And then you'll notice that the error code here was 500, and that was because the validation didn't work. And so the error that we actually got back says uh, validation error, details, subject is required. So we prevented them from inserting like some random stuff into the database because it's actually missing the subject. So let's try to add more stuff. So we'll say subject is first. And let's try to send that. Validation error, message is required. 
So I also need. So, while you're doing yep. this, uh, quick question: Do captures essentially work the same <clears throat> way when they when you're trying to do validation well, like this? Captures will prevent a form from even being submitted. So what what we're doing right now is we're we're um, mimicking or imitating what our HTML form is actually going to be doing under the hood because when we click add message that is going to make a post request with JavaScript and like send the data over. Um, but the way a capture works is before even allowing you to send the data to the server, it wants to make sure that you can solve the captcha and that just prevents like server load. So you, uh, b before it even reaches the server, you have to actually be able to solve the captcha and then it will let you make the request to the server. Um, and that's basically to prevent people from like spamming it with hundreds and hundreds of requests uh, because if if we let right. this happen, like they're already they're already sending our server messages, and they're already like, um, basically putting our server under a workload because it has having to interpret all these messages that's be, that are being sent. Uh, and so the message will be, "Hello, world." And that actually got inserted. So we didn't have an image URL, but you'll notice the status code is now two hundred. 200 and um, it sent back the message that got inserted and the way databases usually work is when you insert things they'll have some unique ID on them and so this has a unique ID but because this is now in the database when I make a get request to slash messages now instead of an empty array I get an array with everything that's in the database right so because I just inserted that uh, this is actually all of the data that's in the database right now. So get request on slash messages. Cool, right? Sounds good. <laughs> all right, Sounds so good. Let's, let's try to put like another message in the database. Uh, so we're gonna do a post request to slash messages. Uh, in this case, the username is gonna be Tony. Um, the subject, what do you want the subject to be, Tony? Just do second. Just do second. Second? second. Question mark. And what do you want your message to be? <laughs> Goodbye, world. Goodbye, cruel world. Goodbye, cruel world. Dot, dot, dot. Uh, and let's also throw an image in there. Um, what did we have it? Is it image URL? So image capital URL. Um, let's, let's grab like a, a jiffy. Oh God! This is this is what ruins it every time. <laughs> uh, and Tony is referring to when we—I think this was the the Craigslist clone that we built. Um, something went wrong. Oh no! <laughs> there you go. See, I just want a goodbye, Jeff. Come on. All right, I'm, okay, I'm going to go use the restroom real quick while you, no while you look up that. And if you're watching live, uh, if you have any questions in the chat, um, let me know. Media source. Oh, Web P. It does work in an image tag, it looks like. All right, that's what I'm gonna use though. So uh, image URL is going to be that. We will post it to the server. It got inserted. And so now if we do a get request to the server, we should see both messages are there. Um, <clears throat> Tony is away right now, but one thing I do want to do is basically say, if the message doesn't have a username, we're going to set it to be anonymous. So let's just do that right here. We'll say, um, if 
not message dot username then message dot username will be anonymous and so yeah and so mm -hmm. <laughs> um, basically what I'm doing Tony is when they try to create a message if they're if they didn't specify a username, we're just going to set that to anonymous. Um, the idea is like this is an anonymous message board; anyone can post messages, and so we'll we'll default to that if there was no username. Okay. Yeah. So on um, crack.com, you know the uh, comedy website. Yeah. So like whenever people are commenting on a picture and or a, a post or something, and they don't have like a user image, it defaults to the classic pencil sketch of the Unabomber. Um, <laughs> so if you go to the bottom, uh, yeah, see, oh. it's the Unabomber okay. sketch. <laughs> cool. Yeah. We, we could do that. See. I don't know if we will, but... <laughs> I don't want to use the Unabomber. <laughs> okay, but uh, I inserted a message as you, Tony, and uh, we have this nice image URL. Let's show up. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Okay, cool. Perfect. So, um, yeah, so we're inserting messages. That's great. Our back end is basically working. Now we need to create a front end where we can insert their, inf their message into a form, make the request to the back end to create the message, and then uh, show all the messages on the page. Sound good? OK, so let's do it. Sounds great. Um, let's look at our readme. We are validating the message. We are inserting it into the database, and we are responding with the inserted message if it actually works. All right, um, and actually, before we create this new message form, let's just load all of the um, the existing messages on the page when the page loads. So we'll close all of these. And then on our client, in our home view, um, <clears throat> we are going to have a, a mounted method. So when the home page gets mounted or created, this will run. And then we're going to make a request to our API. Um, let's store the API URL, URL in a variable. So right here, Tony, just say uh, const API URL in all caps. API underscore URL is equal to quotes with HTTP colon slash slash uh, no s localhost colon one two three four slash messages. Cool. And so uh, when the page loads, we're going to make a request against that to get back all of our messages. And so here inside of mounted, do fetch. And then pass in API underscore URL. And then do a dot then. And this will accept uh, the response. So say response. And then do a fat arrow. And then just say, uh, with no body, just say uh, get rid of the curly. Just say response.json. And invoke it. Cool. And then lastly, after the last parenthesis, do uh, dot then again. And then the parameter here will be result. And then create a fat arrow with a body. And we'll do uh, console.log result. Cool. So. When the page loads, we should be making a request to our server and then just logging out the array of all of the messages. Let's see if it works. So we'll open the dev tools. There's our array of two messages. And there they are. So when the page loads, we're getting them from the server. Cool. Um, let's look at Bootstrap. I think I want to do something like this, like, um, we can put we can show the image a little bit larger, but for every message, we'll show like a decently sized image, the subject of the post, the body of the post, and we'll probably put the username like to the left or to the right or something like that. Does that sound good? Yeah, we could do 
the like username and then below that we can put like the subject yeah and italics definitely. or something okay so basically we want this for every message um and so now instead of saying it's home we'll get rid of that we'll throw this in and we'll get rid of all these extras because this one is the one that we're going to repeat for every message in our array. Okay, so on this list item, um, and actually before we even do that, we need to put this array on our data on our component. So here, let's create a data property. Let's say data, and then uh, the value is a fat arrow function. So do a fat arrow uh, with uh, empty parameters. Then the fat arrow. And then uh, instead of curly braces, use parentheses and then put the curly braces inside the parentheses and then do a new line. And what this says is, um, we'll do, we'll, we'll do a, a new line inside of the object. What this says is, this is a fat arrow function that just immediately returns an object. Um, and on that, we'll say messages and we'll initialize that to just an empty array. So messages colon empty array. And um, now when we get back the result right here, we'll say uh, this dot messages equals result. Let's take a quick break. And now we essentially want to repeat this list item for every message in the messages array, right? So on this list item, let's do a v-4. And so this is a, um, a Vue.js thing that allows you to repeat an array. And so v4 equals, and in double quotes, we'll say message in messages, uh, do a space. So message, space, in, space, messages. And so messages corresponds to the messages on our data. Message is the name we're going to give to everyone inside of it. Uh, we need to give this list item a key. So after the double quotes, uh, do a space, and then say uh, colon key. No, after, after the double quotes, do a colon key. Uh, no space after the colon equals and we'll say message dot underscore ID sorry you cut out again. <laughs> uh, message you underscore dot underscore ID so we want to grab the ID property of the message cool give me just a second make sure I'm caught up on chat Uh, yes, so this is going to get repeated for every message. Now, um, the source is going to be bound to message.imageURL. Uh, URL. I think we give it all caps URL. Cool. And in front of the SRC, put a colon, because that means we want to actually bind the value of SRC to be uh, whatever the image URL is. Cool. And then for alt, let's also bind that. So do a colon alt. And the value inside of there will just be, uh, let's say, message.subject. Cool. And then. Um, where the H5 is, I guess that's where we want to put the message subject. So where it says list-based media object, let's get rid of that and then just do um, <clears throat> uh, handlebars with message.subject. And then below that, let me help you out because there's a, there's a lot going on there. Um, yeah, I guess just below that, what did we, did we call it? Was it 
message dot message okay so right there just do message dot message did i say chad no i didn't chad i said chat <laughs> but welcome to the stream <laughs> message dot message yeah because message the message property is the actual thing that they typed in okay um where do we want to put their username i thought we were going to do it like right on top and then do the uh, subject below that, then the body, and then maybe even below that we can actually put when okay, it was so let's, posted. Okay, so let's try that. So um, let's do that, but instead of an H5, let's do like an H4, so it's a little bit bigger. And then there we'll do message.username. Um, and then maybe after that we have like a new line and then we'll show when it was posted really small. So like message dot created, like that. Yeah, it looks perfect. Okay, yeah, sorry. it looks perfect. So now, oh, there it is. <laughs> it's working. Um, we need to have some special logic that says like, if there is no image, don't show the image. And then maybe we'll have like a maximum width for the image or something like that. So let's do that. So on the image, let's do a, a v dash if. And just set that equal to message.image URL. So basically, if there is no image URL, we won't show the image. Uh, image URL. Yep. Cool. And yeah, so that hides it there. Um, let's give this whole list item. Actually, let's if we close this. Actually, one thing we probably should do is in our layout, let's give the router view a class of container. That'll like center it on the page or like give it some space on the sides. Cool. And then um, let's give this image like a maximum width. Let's see how it's being styled right now. Could we do like a little white? Um bar like between yeah, messages um i don't know if there's anything in bootstrap we could just use like a, a horizontal rule there isn't there an html, there, isn't there an HTML tag of yeah, like yeah like absolutely. hr um and so after the the thing that we're repeating is the list item so if we throw an hr right here let's see what that does uh I don't know if it has any stylings on it or does it need it. It's just not showing up. Um, margin bottom, margin top one rim. It should have like a, I don't know what happens if we give it a color or it's crossed out down there. What's crossed out? On the second one. Does that mean oh, that just means certain styles are being overridden. Let me see if I give it a background. A red, does it show up? No. Or a, um, let's just, I don't know if there's anything in the bootstrap docs. Um, line, inline text element, code blocks, column breaks. <laughs> um, let's search for it, bootstrap. Horizontal rule. My my thought is maybe also because it's inside of this list item. Like, what happens if we put it there? Does it show up? Oh, it just has a color that we can't see. Let me try changing the color of it like to white color. again. Yeah, there it is. Okay, um, we need to just give it a specific style. So let's do this. Um, in here, we should be able to add a style tag. And then we'll say HR has – oh, is that not working? I think we need to probably need like a new line. Let's see. Um, 
if we do a line break and then add the HR, does it show up? I can swear I see like two faint lines on the screen. Um, I can't. It looks like they're off to the side though. I think uh, one issue is um, when they're inside the list items, some like special styles are being applied to it. What if we did this? What if we put the HR on the outside and then we did a V4? Like what if we just made this a div? And we did the V4 on the div itself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, but we, do you want it to be red? What color do we want it to be? I, th I thought it'd be white. I, th I thought it'd be white nice if it was um, white. Let's grab the style. Hard refresh. Cool. All right, let's give that image some special styling too, just so it's not super wide. Um, Do like a max width, Do like a yeah, max width so and say, height. Uh, you can type this, say image. Uh, James Ross is asking, are you at a standing desk? I am. Um, it's a pretty basic setup. I got like a uh, some height adjustable legs from Ikea and just put it on a, a taller cable. And uh, Wilbo is saying he just slacked G75, my new haircut, thanks. So G75 was the class I used to teach. Um, yeah, so let's do max width is, I don't know, 300 pixels. And then say height is auto. Yeah, let's see what that does. Cool. Yeah, and so now, That's much better. no matter what, the images will only be that wide. Cool. We are on our way, Tony. I think the last thing is we're going to add a form to create a new message, and we've got we've got it. And then maybe we'll deploy. What do you think? Sounds good. Cool. Sounds good. All right. So right above this, we're going to add a nice little form. So create a form tag. And actually, let's let's go to the Bootstrap docs because uh, they have. Um, let me just like copy it in. Yeah, something like this. Let's put that in. Um, oop. Nope, undo that. Cool. Um, that is a text area. We can hold on to that. Select boxes. Cool. So um, on this first one, let's give this, the, the for attribute will be username. Cool, and then inside the label, put a uh, username. And then for the input, the type is gonna be text. And then ID should be a uh, username. And then a uh, placeholder. Um, actually, get rid of the placeholder and let's just set a value. So say value is anonymous. So like, yeah, right there you can just add an attribute. So uh, do value equals, and then in double quotes put anonymous. Cool. I'm gonna do a capital A just because, but <laughs> let's look at what we got so far. So username, anonymous. Um, we basically want another one another input, but this is going to be subject instead of username. Cool. And then update the ID. And 
here instead of value let's do a placeholder on this one so say placeholder is enter a subject cool um, and both username and subject are required so just on there just add the word required and that will use the the built the browser's built-in um, validation to make sure that that's required cool and then do the same thing on the subject cool and then instead of this being example text area this should just be message Uh, message. Wait, I'm sorry, what? Uh, two S's in a message. Cool. And then the text inside of the label should just say message. Cool. And then um, below that, the ID should be message. Cool. And then lastly, image. yeah, so we image. Can do a similar thing here, but let's just make this uh, image URL. Cool. And then that should be image URL. And then um, ID will be image URL. I think on uh, on type, can you put URL there? Uh, do all lowercase URL. I think the browser might work on our behalf and try to validate for us. And then this is not required, so let's get rid of required there. And change the placeholder to be um, enter an image URL. <laughs> cool. I like it. Uh, let's see what we got. Yep. And then last thing we need is a nice little button. Um, let's, let's go to the bootstrap docs to find, and actually we can, which color button do we want? Let's use one of those pretty, little pretty blue pretty ones. ones. Okay. Uh, button primary, I guess is what we want. There. And we will say uh, add message. And this will be a type of submit so that this button submits the form. Um, Do we need to bind it? We need to bind the submit function of the form, yeah. So on the form, if we do... Um, at submit, take a quick break. Yeah, so you can do um, at submit e uh, dot prevent, so we'll prevent the default action, equals uh, no spaces, and then in double quotes, say uh, add message. And so now we need a method called add message. So in our component, uh, right here, we'll add a uh, methods property. So let's just say methods, and that's an object. Uh, so do colon yep, methods, methods, meth, meth, methods is an object. And inside of that object is where we're going to add uh, the function add message. Cool. And then give this a nice little body. Cool. And inside of here is where we're actually going to make the post requests. But first thing is we need to actually uh, bind all of the things that they're typing in the form here to our data. So on our data, let's create a property called uh, message 
Uh, Scott just mentioned, should username be required in the form? Uh, no, because we're going to default it to, um, well, I guess yes, but it, the default value is anonymous. So by default, when the page loads, it just has the word anonymous in there. So message is going to be an object, and it's going to have all of those properties. Um, so we'll have username. And actually, this is where we can set the value to be anonymous in single quotes. And then we also need subject, and that will just default to the empty string. Yep, and then also image URL. Empty string, cool. And so now on our data, because we have all of these things, we're now gonna bind the form uh, to these values so that as the user types, it just updates them here. And then this is what we'll actually send to the server to create it. So um, yeah, actually we can get rid of value. And then on each one of these inputs, we're gonna bind it to our data. So on this input, do v, v dash model And then the value in double quotes is just going to be uh, message.username. And then you're going to do the same thing on the subject input, but the vModel will be message.subject. So on this, this, stop, <laughs> on this, this input here. And then the same thing on the text area. That's the label. You want to do it right there. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, on the input for the image URL. So now all that's being bound to the message. So when this add message function gets called, if we just log this.message, we should see everything that they typed into the form. Uh, let's try it. Um, so yeah, subject, hello again. This is a new message. And then let's go to Jiffy Cat. Let's search for funny. Why is the internet being so slow? Nan GIFs found for funny. Oh, okay. This one. Um, I want the GIF URL. Yeah, cool. So here, I'll put the image URL there. And then we should log that. This is an object that has all of the properties. Very cool. Um, so now we actually want to send this to the server. Let's do that. Are you ready, Tony? I'm ready. <laughs> okay. I'm ready. Um, so we are going to do a fetch just like before. So say fetch and then pass in the API URL. But this is a little more complicated because by default, a fetch is a get request. But if you remember, our backend is set up to receive a post request. So after this, we need to pass in an object of options. The first option is going to be the method. So say method colon, and the value here is going to be post. So we're making a post request. So put it in single quotes. Cool. And then uh, the body of this request Remember, we're logging rec.body on the server side. So the body of this request is going to be this.message because this.message is what we're, we're sending. And not in quotes because we're sending um, the actual 
object that we created, we're, that's what we're sending to the server. But uh, the server only understands JSON, so we actually need to stringify this. So JSON.stringify. Basically, we're taking this JavaScript object, turning it into a JSON string, and then that's going to be the body of the request that we're actually sending to the server. Tracking? Cool. Yeah, I'm following along. And so um, the, the last thing is we need to tell the server that we're sending it JSON data. So we do this with headers. So say headers, and then headers is going to be an object. Cool. And then the property here is going to be um, it put single quotes and say content-type. And then the value in single quotes will be application slash JSON. Uh, lowercase json cool so basically what we're saying is all right we're making a post request to this url which is the url of our server <clears throat> and the body of our request is going to be whatever they typed into the form as a json string and we're telling the server that the content type of the body the thing that we're sending it is json so it knows to actually parse the body to do something with that request Cool. Uh, lastly, we are just going to do basically the exact same thing. But now, um, instead of uh, just um, um, setting messages, we will actually, um, the result, let's just log it out for now. So let's just log out, uh, do a console log of result. This should be the message that got inserted into the database. Moment of truth. We'll do a hard refresh. We'll say subject, hello again. This is fun. Um, not that. Let's grab this URL. We'll click add message. And I think it worked, Tony. So notice what got logged. It actually has an ID. It has the created date. So this actually got sent to our server and created. And if we refresh the page, we should see it there. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> so um, this is working. Uh, one thing I want to do, though, is uh, show the messages in like uh, like most recently created at the top. So. Let's do this. Let's say um, we're going to have a computed property. Well, actually, yeah, we'll have a computed property. So right here, just say computed. <clears throat> and this is going to be an object. So uh, computed is an object. And then a property we're going to have on here is a method called uh, reversed messages. Cool. And this is going to be a function. And here we're just going to return this dot messages dot slice because we're going to make a copy of the array. And then after that, we'll say dot reverse because reverse um, reverses the array in line and, and invoke reverse. Cool. Wait. Um, yeah, cool. So we're reversing the messages. And so now in the view, instead of repeating over messages, we're going to repeat over reverse messages. And so now by default, it should show, show top to bottom. Cool. Um, and then. Now, whenever we get back the result, we're just going to push that into the array. So here, just say this.messages.push and pass in result. And that should add it to the array. And now when you create a message, it should automatically show up on the page. 
Um, just real quick, let's add like a nice little button to like hide and show the uh, the form. So right here, just say like uh, show message form. And when this is clicked, well, we'll just like say toggle, toggle message form. And show message form should just be a property on our data that is initially false. And then when we click it, it should, um, should toggle it, but we only want to show the form if show message form is true. So initially the page is there. Um, let's add some spacing around this real quick. So I think we could do um, margin top three, should push it down a little bit. And then let's give this form a margin bottom, margin bottom three. Um, and also this margin bottom three. Cool. And so when we click this, it shows the form. Click this, it hides the form. But Tony, please have the honors of attempting to add a new message. Uh, let me close my break timer real quick, sorry. All right, username. Mr. Mayo, subject, I am who I say I am. Okay, <laughs> what's your message? <clears throat> this is the greatest forum of all time. Yes, it is. Uh, would you like to grab a random image from the interwebs? Yeah, let's... Uh do a victory, do like a victory one, like maybe we can find Stewie or something. Victory, um, Stewie. <clears throat> let's, do, let's do that third, that third one, that third one, that's great. Okay. It's all pixelated though, let's see if Jiffy has a better one. Do the tab. <laughs> do the tab one. Okay. Um, we'll do copy link. Well, I think what I found out is 3GP, is that right? Yeah, I think that's the one that is the actual image URL. Oh no, I should do it. Yeah, okay, so that's the image URL. We're gonna put this here, we're gonna add it. Uh, internal server error. Um, this was one issue we're not actually um, um, showing an error if there was an error, but let's let's see what happened. If we look at the network, we can see the actual request that went out. Validation error details: username must only contain alphanumeric characters. <laughs> ah, yeah, it had a punctuation. Uh, just a second though, we should we should be able to handle these errors um, and like show them on the page. Let's do this. So, um, and we are Tony, stop moving your mouse. <laughs> we I'm you were though. I'm, I'm not doing anything. Okay, so we um, we have been streaming close to two hours. So this is where I'm gonna actually start typing um, a little bit more, but. Um, Basically, we saw there that when there's an error, there is a details property. So basically, here's what I'm going to do. Like, when we get back the response, we'll say um, if result.details, then that means there was an error. Um, else, there was not an error, and we'll just put it in the array. Um, but if there was an error, we want to look at uh, details. We want to look at all the messages inside of the um, the details property. So let's say error is result dot details dot map. 
and we only want uh, the message, and then we want to join that um, on a space. And so we should be able to um, log out the error. And so if there are multiple errors, we'll, we'll see those in the console. No, you, you misspelled error, error on there. Error, error, error. Cool. So basically what this does is it, it takes all of the errors in the details array, gets back just the message, which will say like username, can't have alphanumeric, bring them all together with a space, and then we'll show that on the page. But oh. um, okay. let's... I can't scroll to the right. What's on? Does it end with a period? It doesn't. Let's join it with a period space. Okay, so now if we try to post this, oh, it's required. Um, but Mr. Mayo again, add a message. Please enter your, oh, our client side validation is kicking in. Username must only contain alphanumeric characters. So if there is an error, we're actually getting it in the console. So now we can just like show this on the form. Um, we can show that in an, yeah. An, an alert. alert. So let's show like this warning one. So like uh, right, I think we can show it inside the form. Um, yeah, let's show it here. And we'll only show it if there is an error. And then um, let's say error. And then right inside of there, we'll just we'll show whatever the error is. Error. And we will have error on our data. That's initially just an empty string. And then when we get the error, we'll just say this.error equals the error. Cool. So we try to enter some things. Um, oh, I thought I had the image. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> okay, so we'll grab that URL. Um, add it. Oh, it worked. Because I, I didn't, put, I didn't. Put oh, it. you didn't. Yeah, <laughs> put Mr. Mayo. Uh, Mr. Mayo. Error. Username must only contain alphanumeric characters. Cool. And so uh, here's the other thing: is if it worked, we'll set this dot error to be the empty string, so it like hides the error. And we'll also say this dot show message form is false. So like it immediately uh, closes the form whenever we're done. Cool. Um, what else were we doing? Yeah, I think that's it. So now if we refresh the page, automatically when the page loads, we're seeing all of the messages that are stored on the server. Um, we're doing validation, so they can't just enter random things into our database. We did it, Tony. Thoughts? It uh, <laughs> looks good. I feel like I am uh, in way too underqualified to do this okay. sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot going on, and we like rushed to quite a few things. Um, I think one one last thing I'll do is try to deploy this to Heroku. I don't know how long it's going to take, but we can put this on the internet so all you wonderful people watching at home can go add all of your messages. What do you think about that, Tony? All right, so sounds good. <laughs> what could, what go, could wrong? go wrong? Uh, Dashboard.heroku.com. I'm already logged. Oh, I'm not. I don't know what my password is. Um, just give me a second. I'm going to hide my screen. I'm going to try to log in. It's hidden from the stream, and they can't hear you right now, Tony. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
just just a just a second, Tony. Um, okay, ask your question, Tony. So like, a giant company that has like a bunch of web developers. What do all of them do all day in terms of like work? Um, various things. Um, <laughs> like like a fr uh, <laughs> I know that's. Uh I know that sounds like a weird question to ask, but I'm like thinking like, like let's say you you have like your your essentially your app is already made, your website's already made. Like, what are these people doing all all day? Um, I know that seems like well, a weird question. They're to they're ask. fixing bugs. They're adding new features. Like like yeah, like if an app already exists, like it's it's ever changing. Like, just because Google has a product doesn't mean that um, it. Yeah. Right, right. I'm just like. I'm just like trying to think of what, like, like um, for example, I'm I'm going to that like cover my meds um, thing, and I know they employ a lot of web developers, but I'm just like kind of curious as to like what all of these people do on like a day to day basis. Um, just a second. Uh, but it, it totally varies. Um, you could be implementing new features. You could be fixing bugs. You could be working on front end stuff or back end stuff. Um, it's it's wide open, and and varies by job. Hey Kim, welcome to the stream. I miss you too. <laughs> I used to work with Kim. Um, cool. We'll shelve that. I think I think I will actually do uh, pretty soon. I'll start doing like a Q Q and A. Uh, maybe once or twice a month, and then people can ask questions just like that. And I can talk about like what did I do at my last job, that kind of thing. Um, but I am on Heroku. You can sign up for free on Heroku.com. You can create apps. One thing it allows you to do though is add resources, and one of the resources we want is a Mongo database. So I'm going to add that provision. And um, now I have a Mongo database in the cloud. <laughs> um, one thing is it creates an environment variable called MongoDB URI. And this is how we're actually going to connect to the remote Mongo database. Um, so in our backend code, before, when we just hard-coded this connection string, here is where we can say process.env.mongodb URI or that. So like if this exists, meaning like you're running in, in the cloud, connect to that database, otherwise connect to the database on my local machine. Cool. Um, the way Heroku works is um, it expects your code to be a Git repo. So I'm actually going to create two separate Git repos. We're going to have a Git repo in our server folder and then a Git repo in our client folder. So I'm going to do a Git init in the server folder. And we'll do a git ignore node. So I have this special command that will automatically add this git ignore, which ignores like node modules and, and other things like that. Um, so that's there. And then let's do a git status. We will add everything. Cool. And so our server folder is now a git repo. And then if we look on Heroku, um, basically you add your remote from Heroku and you push to that. And when you push to that remote, it actually deploys it in the cloud. So I'm gonna do a git remote add Heroku, put that there. And now if I do a git remote dash V, my backend server now has that remote. And if I do a git push, Heroku master. This is going to push my server side code um, up to, or it's not. Um, let me hide my screen again. So um, there is the Heroku CLI tool, which you can install to actually get that command. And um, I have that installed, but I need to log in. You can do a Heroku login and it'll ask for your email and password. I'm gonna hide my screen real quick. Cool, so now I'm logged in. 
And um, now that I'm logged in, I should be able to do a git push Heroku master. And this is going to take my git repo in this server folder, push it up to Heroku, and we're actually going to have our backend app running in the cloud. I just went really fast, Tony. Questions, thoughts, comments? Uh, I have massive, uh, massive <laughs> nosebleed. Uh, I think I um, followed along. Basically, you took all the stuff and put it on Heroku. And it essentially works through Git repos. So by pushing it up to GitHub, it now exists. And if I do a Heroku uh, open, uh, this will actually load it up. And you'll notice when we go to slash, uh, that that default message board message is loaded there. But if I go to slash messages, we should get an empty array. Uh, but now we can make requests against this URL. So um, now in our client side code, we actually want to make requests there instead of local host. So I'm just going to replace that. And then let's deploy our client side code. For So to deploy the client side, I'm going to use uh, a tool called now. So I'm going to go into my client folder. And when you create a Vue.js app, the package JSON has this build script. And that will actually create files that the browser can understand. So if I do npm run build, that will create files that I can then deploy to the web. So if you were to do a um, like a, a newer commit on the Git uh, GitHub repository, would this change would, the Heroku? So, um, and, that, and that's a good point. So like any time you make changes to the server side code, you then have to push up to, up to Heroku again. Um, so you would commit locally and then push up to Heroku and then the changes will be, be, be reflected in the cloud. But they would only show up in the cloud on Heroku if you committed and pushed those changes up. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, cool. Yeah, so now yeah, that basically. I ran build inside the client folder, I have this dist folder, and this is the folder that I want to deploy. So for that, I'm using a tool called now, and you can check out uh, now.sh, and it's a simple command line tool to install, and you can deploy static sites for free. So that gives us this URL, but I'm going to give it an alias. Full stack message board. Cool. So now I have this URL. It's there. Tony, would you like the honors of creating the first on the internet full stack message? <laughs> this is it. We are off on a grand adventure. Yes, we are. Okay, okay what? Let's get a Lord of the Rings okay. <laughs> looking thing. So yeah, I started re-watching the first movie uh -huh. and it is a lot different than Which I remember. Mm, we should do a Gollum one. <laughs> one? Uh, go down. Let's, Let's just search for, uh, is it Gollum like that? Oh, no, 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 wait, go back. Do, do that one of Frodo and the ring, where he's just, like, playing with the ring down there. You see that? This that one? Is, this one? Okay. That's terrible. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's, let's grab it. And if I click it, we should get, yeah, the actual image URL. Cool. <laughs> um, and so we'll put this there. We'll add the message it got added and so now i'm going to post this url in the chat anyone out there in the world you should be able to go to that url and post messages and you should see our messages too what could go wrong <laughs> probably a lot uh but if anything does go horribly wrong uh we can actually go in and just like drop the entire database and then all of the messages will be gone <laughs> cool. Um, Tony, any last thoughts, comments, questions? Um, I think uh, it's it's kind of cool. Like this is almost like um, 
a super version of like all the other things that we've done so far. Because it's actually persisting data. Yeah, like everything we've done so far did not have a backend database. Yeah, like we, we actually took something that we did and like it exists on the internet now in like a basic form. Nobody out there is adding any messages. That's okay though. It's your civic <laughs> duty. Cool. Um, yeah, awesome. I will push this code up, both the client and server repos. I'll put a link in the description. Thanks everyone for watching. Uh, any last comments, questions, thoughts about the app that we've built, Tony? And also you watching at home? Um, I think, uh, I don't know, this is a really cool Definitely. project. Like, uh, some of the things I wanted to add in the future, like, um, so we are showing all the messages. We are creating new messages. Um, but one thing it would be cool is to have users be able to reply to messages. So, like, on an individual message, uh, you can click reply, and then instead of showing up as, like, the main message, it shows, like, as a reply to this message. And kind of like indented um yeah and then maybe you could even like arrow and like hide yeah, exactly. the replies so show replies hide replies and then also like messages into categories so right now this is just one big message board but we could do like the nature pictures message uh section or the um anime section or the cartoon section and each one would have or supposed to have like messages specific to that topic and for that, we would probably like add a field in the database, like um, like when we're uh, inserting a message, you would also have like topic, and then we could have a route where it only returns the messages with that that specific topic or something like that. So that wouldn't necessarily, so that wouldn't necessarily be like a, a bunch of infinite routes. It's just like you're like using yeah, the route so to search. Yeah, so it could search. be something like. Um, instead of requesting slash messages. And so actually we can we can see our backend now. Um, ooh. And we can see like things that people added as JSON data without actually yeah, seeing so the app itself too. Yeah, so if you go to slash too. messages, anything that's in the database is gonna show up here. And um, my thought is like, we could update this to say like topic is anime. And that would only show you, like, it doesn't work right now, obviously, but we could update the route to take that into account and then only query the database for anything where the topic is anime. Cool, that's for a future episode. All right. Anything else, Tony? I think, uh, I think that's it. We, uh, <laughs> we did we it. Did it. Awesome. <laughs> Um, yeah, as I mentioned, I'll push this code up to GitHub, put the links below. Thanks everyone for watching. Um, tomorrow night, I'm going to be doing code katas. So if you check out my YouTube channel, I have all the upcoming live streams there. Uh, tomorrow night is um, code katas number four. This is just where I solve code katas live. You can submit code katas. So if you visit Coding Garden on GitHub and go to the code katas repo, under issues, you can submit a link to a kata you would like me to solve. You can also throw it as a comment on any of my past kata videos. I should be able to see that. Uh, but yeah, thanks everyone for watching. Tony, thanks for being you. Oh, I, I do it so well. <laughs> awesome. um, have a wonderful afternoon, morning, evening, night, wherever you are in the world, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.